Good morning, everybody. Um, it's good to see all of you t- today. Man, people came to church today. It's awesome. We're not scared, are we? No. But we do stay six feet apart. Uh, we are continuing with our, 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 our uh, series on the book of James, and I am loving this series. I am really, I think James is probably my favorite book of the Bible. I'm just kidding. John is still the, my favorite book of the Bible. But James is coming in uh, maybe second. Now, as I, as I study the book of James and the man James, it's um, fascinating to think. When you're thinking through the things that he says and you're thinking about who he is, it's amazing to put those pieces together. So the book of James, uh, we are in the second chapter this week. And, of course, as I said last week, we can't cover every single uh, theme in the book of James. But today we are covering a theme that is mentioned in the second chapter as uh, Katie read to us earlier. And let's just give her a hand for for reading for us. Thank you, Katie. Um, So the, the theme today is faith and deeds. Faith and deeds. Um. I, there's a commentary that I read a lot. It's uh, by w- William Barclay. Uh, it's a set of commentaries my father gave to me. And I read them a lot. And I really love him. He's my favorite commentator. And this is something that he said. And I couldn't put it better. Uh, there's, I don't think it could be put any better than this. And this is what he said. He said, Faith and deeds are not opposites. They are inseparable. Faith and deeds are not opposites. They are inseparable. You can't have one, really, without the other. And the thing that I love about the scripture we're going to read today and how the scripture, the NIV, puts it, it puts it this way. It says, your deeds complete your faith. Your deeds complete your faith. Your faith is not complete unless you act on it, right? Right? I have a whole lot to say about all of this, but we're going to get into the scripture, and um, and we're going to start here in chapter twelve and go from there. James says, "Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom." Whew, I love that law, the law that gives freedom, because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. The law of the Old Testament brings death. That's what Paul talked about, right? The, the law brings death. But, but James is talking about a new law. He's talking about the law of love, the law that gives freedom. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Uh, this principle has changed my life. And when I say that, I'm not just saying it because it's another week and Rob's going to say that something changed his life. I'm telling you because it really did change my life. I am bent. Uh, some of you type A personalities, you understand the feeling. I'm bent toward, uh, you know, just task-driven Stuff and I'm hard on myself and I'm hard on other people and I'm bent toward judgment. Anybody else have a problem with being judgmental? Not too many hands going up, but listen, I know you. I know that there are more people. This is a problem for us. Judgment is a problem. And it's one of the biggest problems in the church, right? Jesus himself, the only person who was qualified to judge when they brought the woman who was caught in the act of adultery to him, he said, where are your accusers? And they were all gone. And he said, neither do I accuse you. Jesus, the only one, the only one who was qualified to judge did not judge. We read a scripture, it was either last week or the week before, where Jesus says, I will not judge you. I did not come to judge. I came to save. And let me tell you something about yourself. He has sent you not to judge, but to save. That is who we are. And I find that this principle works so well in my life. So 
this last year, I, I had a, a chance, an opportunity to be merciful to someone who had stolen from me. And I'm glad that I had a chance to be merciful. In fact, it was, it was actually more than one occasion. I have had a chance to be merciful to someone who has stolen from me. And so when I was merciful, whenever I was merciful, uh, God, in turn, I could feel that God was heaping his mercy on me. And that's the way it works. The more merciful you are to others, the more God heaps his mercy on you. He, the more he heaps his grace on you. And you might say, well, well that, that works pretty good. I can just, just be merciful to others and I can just live like the devil but that is not the way it works the more merciful you are to someone else the more like Christ you become I'll say that again the more merciful I want you to get it. the more merciful you are to others the more like Christ you become and the more like Christ you become the more obedient you become it is a beautiful beautiful principle this 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 uh, tool of mercy is probably the most beautiful tool that we have in our tool chest to, to not only build a, a, a Christ-like life in our own world, but to build others, to build Christ-like people. This, this tool of mercy, it is a beautiful, beautiful thing. James says, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. He's talking about something that is real here. He says, if one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs. Uh, this last week, Lene and um, Julie Johnson toured the Learning Center, which is not far from here. It's just down, down the road. And, and when they went in, uh, I wasn't there, so I may not get the story exactly right, but they went in and someone uh, asked, uh, you know, where are you from? And they, they, and they said, we're from the Net Church. And they said, oh, we have some uh, thank you cards for you. Is that right? So the, the, they, they brought out these thank you notes. And they said, because of COVID, we haven't been able to present these to your church. But we just want to thank your church. And Lene said, well, I think what you're talking about is something that was done for the Learning Center. But it, it didn't come from the church. It came from... Ben Johnson and when they heard the name when they said the name Ben Johnson one of the ladies there said Ben Johnson Ben Johnson she said to Julie are you the wife of Ben Johnson see Ben Johnson is famous over at the learning center and none of us even knew that he was famous over there let me tell you why he's famous at the learning center he's famous because last year we invited uh, several people to go uh, to this fundraiser and the Johnsons were one of the uh, couples that we invited to go and uh, and they went to this this function with us and uh, there were hundreds of people there and at the end people began to you know write their checks and give their donations and I don't know how much money was raised but I'm sure there was a lot of money raised that night but Ben did not stop there and I'll tell you listen I can say this about Ben I know Ben I saw Ben stuff something in an envelope. I saw him leave something on the table. And I know he gave that night, but he didn't stop there. He went on. After that night, he contacted some of his friends and he began to tell them about the Learning Center and, what, and about the need that was there uh, for underprivileged kids, the need for socks and underwear, right? A huge need for socks and underwear. And so they got together and they bought not just the cheapest socks and underwear that you can buy from Walmart. No, they went out and they got 
and, and, and they got the best, what they would get for their own kids. Spider-Man underwear. I don't know how many pairs of Spider-Man underwear I've seen in my lifetime with my three boys. In fact, they're probably wearing, no, no, I wouldn't say it. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, guys. Listen, they got the best, and they brought it to the learning center. And, and when they brought it to the learning center, uh, the, the, pe the families came in, and the, this was around Christmas time, I believe, and the families came in, and not only were they able to supply their own needs, but they were calling their friends and saying, look, there is, there is the supply of, of underwear and socks here, and, and I, I know that you need... You know, they were calling their friends. I know that you need this for your family too. Give me sizes so I can get some socks and underwear for your children. And so that was how it was at Christmas time. It was like Christmas. It's Christmas time for people who were in need. This is what Ben Johnson did. See, he saw a need and he didn't just say, Well, God bless y'all. Write a check and God bless y'all. No, he decided to go and do something about it. He put his action where his faith was, and it completed his faith. And I can tell you, I haven't talked to Ben about it. I didn't even know that he had done it until when they told me uh, this last week. But I can tell you this, that Ben is a better Christian today because of what he did last year. I can tell you that his heart is better. I can tell you that his soul is in a better place. I can tell you that Ben's faith has grown because he put his faith into action. And that's what we should all do. Deeds, our actions, complete our faith. It's a real thing. It's a real thing. Let's go on. But someone will say, you have faith and I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds and I will show you my faith by my deeds. This is, this is James, man. He's plain. I love James. He is to the point. Some will say, you have faith I, and he, some will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds and I will show you my faith by my deeds. My whole life, I've heard this term, faith versus works. Faith versus works. People argue about which is more important. Um, and, and the fact is that it's not either or. It's always, always, always. It's always both. You can't have one without the other. Um, there was, there's this, this ancient, uh, I say ancient, several hundred year old story that was told about Martin Luther. And, and I don't know if the story is true, but it's something that, that people have told down through the years. And when Martin Luther was called by God to go and, um, and follow God's lead and do the things that he did that led toward uh, reformation in the church, um, there was a monk who... Uh, who had decided or who had committed to him, he said, when you go out into the world and you take this message out into the world, I'm going to stay in my room and I am going to pray for you. I have the gift of prayer, so I'm going to stay here and I'm going to pray while you go out and you do the mission that God has called you to do. And so uh, after Martin Luther left and he went out into the world and he began to... Um, to work in this mission that God had given him to do, um, the monk had a dream. And in the dream, there was a man, and he was out reaping a harvest, but there was only one man, and the harvest was too much. And the monk saw that in his dream that the, that the harvest was impossible for one man to reap. And so, in the dream, the man who was who was hopelessly trying to, to reap the harvest, turned his head, and when he turned his head, the monk saw that it was Martin Luther. And so at that point, he left his room and he went out to help Martin Luther. That's the way it is. Someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds, show me your faith without deeds. I will show you my faith by my deeds. 
Then he says something that seems kind of strange. He says, you believe that there's one God? Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. James was talking about something that all Jews knew about. Jesus was even asked this question. If you read the book of Mark, you'll, you'll see this. Where Jesus was asked this question. Master, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus said, hear O Israel, the Lord thy God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And we know the second part of that real well, don't we? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. That's, that's something that, that we're very familiar with in the New Testament, in the New Covenant. But the thing that, that people would recite, that the Jews would recite, is straight out of Deuteronomy. Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God. This is the greatest commandment to them. Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one God. And so, so James was saying to the Jews, he said, okay, great. You believe that there is one God. Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. Whenever Jesus would come into contact with, with someone who was possessed by a demon, the demons would cry out to him and they, and they would say, please do not torment us. You remember these stories in the New Testament? Do not, son of God, son of David, Messiah, do not torment us. This was what the demons knew about Jesus. They were not confused. And he says, you believe, you sit in your room, and you profess that you believe that God is one God, you can sit and believe all you want to. He said, even the demons do that. Even the demons know that God is one God. Even the demons have come into contact with the Messiah. Even the demons know God and they know him well. You foolish person. Do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together. They were working together. And his faith was made complete. His faith was made complete by what he did. By what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that said, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness and he was called God's friend. God told Abraham that he was going to be the father of many nations. Countless people were going to come from Abraham. Do you know that we are Abraham's children? Not by blood, but by the Spirit. See, we believe like Abraham believed. And Abraham believed and it was counted to him, it was credited to him as righteousness, not because he just sat in a room somewhere and believed, but because he took actions. You see, his faith and his actions were working together and his faith was made complete by what he did. His faith was made complete by what he did. Let's talk about what Abraham did. God first told Abraham, he says, I'm going to make you the father of a great nation. But his wife was barren. So later, I won't go through the whole story, but later his wife conceived and they bore a son, Isaac. Isaac represents to Abraham, he represents Abraham's life. Because Abraham's life was going to be carried on through Isaac. It represents his identity because, because Isaac was, was, through Isaac was going to come a great nation. And Abraham was the father of that nation. And they called him, and they still call him to this day, their father, Abraham. So Isaac represented his life. He represented his identity. Everything about Abraham was tied up in his son, Isaac. And then one day, God says to Abraham, he says, I want you to take your son, Isaac, up to the mountain, and I want you to offer him to me as a burnt offering. 
And so that seems strange, right? Because he was the promise. He was the one. It seems strange that God would ask him to die after he's told him, you're going to live. You're going to live. You're going to be the father of a great nation. I'm giving you a son. This is your life. This is your identity. This is your nation. You, you, people see a son here, but this is a nation here. Through him will come a nation. And I am telling you now, I want you to sacrifice him to me. Seems strange. It seems strange. It seems strange to us sometimes when God asks us to do something that seems so contrary, so contrary to what we know that he wants to do in our lives. When he tells us that he wants us to give up something or he wants us to walk away from somebody or he wants us to walk away from something or he wants us to do something that's out of our comfort zone or he wants us to adopt something or somebody or, you know, it just seems crazy to us. It's out of our comfort zone. It's, it's something that's contrary to, to making us feel good and comfortable and secure and all of those things. But when he told Abraham, I want you to go tomorrow and sacrifice your son to me, Abraham woke up early the next morning and he went on his trip with his son. Some of us, if, if God told me, I want you to sacrifice one of your sons, I'd have to pray about that. Oh, I, I'm serious. I'd have to pray about that. Is this God? I'd have to pray long and hard. You would check back with me months later, and I would say, I'm still praying about this. I'm just being honest. That's, that's, the, that's, that's the way it would be with me. But with Abraham, he woke up early. He got busy early the next morning. And you know what he did? See if this sounds familiar. He took the wood and he put it on his son's back. He took the wood and he put it on Isaac's back. He strapped it to his back and they went up the hill. And Isaac asked his father while they were traveling up that hill. He said, where is the lamb for the sacrifice? And Abraham said, God will provide the sacrifice. They went up the hill and when they got to the place where he was to sacrifice his son, he laid the wood out and he laid his son on the wood. Does sound familiar? He laid Isaac on the wood. Sounds to me like Jesus with the cross on his back traveling up that hill of Golgotha and laying himself on the cross of wood. But when Abraham drew back the knife to sacrifice his son, God stopped him. And it was angel of the Lord. And this is a this is a bit of trivia, but in the Old Testament, whenever it refers, whenever the Scripture refers to someone as the angel of the Lord, it's always Christ. It's the picture of Christ in the Old Testament. The angel of the Lord is Christ. Another interesting fact is that when uh, Jesus was uh, on that first Easter morning, when Jesus rose from the dead, it said the angel of the Lord rolled the stone away. Okay, I'm not going to get off on that, but. The angel of the Lord stopped Abraham, and, and, and in that moment, he provided another sacrifice. There was a ram there that was, that was caught in the thicket, and he provided the sacrifice. And Abraham thought, it must have seemed to Abraham very strange. He wants me to give up my life, my everything, my identity it must seem strange. It must have seemed strange to him. And it, it's probably strange to all of you when God says things in the New Testament. Like, I want you to, to give it all to me. I want you to die daily. Like Paul talks about dying to yourself. It sounds strange to us, but there is life that comes out 
of that death. There is life that comes out of that sacrifice. Whenever you complete your faith by a deed, life comes out of that. And James was a witness to the life that Jesus led. And he knew, he knew that this was a bogus thought to think that you can sit in a room somewhere like many people are doing right now on Sunday morning, sitting in a room and just thinking about what they believe about Christ. He knew that that was bogus. He knew that it was useless. He knew that there was nothing to it. There was nothing good that was going to come out of that unless somebody actually does something about what they believe. He knew that because he grew up with Jesus, his older brother. He watched his older brother. Everything that Jesus believed in, he acted on it, and he saw his own brother give his own life, lay his own life down for what he, what he believed in. And what did he believe in? He believed in us. I've talked about this. I've talked about this so much that some of you are going to say, here he goes again. He's talking about this again. But I, I just cannot get past it. The victory was not on the cross. The victory was not coming out of the tomb that morning. The victory was in the garden on the night that Jesus was betrayed as his disciples slept and the enemy was tempting his flesh. Jesus said the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. See, his own brain knew what it was about to go through. The agony, the pain, the anguish, the torment, the, te it's the terror that he was about to go through. And that mind and that body, that brain and that body, it just, you know, you, you, you can't, it was his humanness. And he just didn't, he didn't want to go through that. Father, if there's any way that this cup could pass from me, lest I drink it. But nevertheless... Not my will, but your will be done. And I know that that enemy was talking to him in the garden. And he was saying things like, Why are you still trying with these people? With these humans? You created. He's talking to the creator now because Jesus is the creator. He was in the world, John says, and the world was created by him. He's talking to the creator and he's saying, You created these people... And the first two that you created, you told them, you can do anything you want to in paradise. I've, I've given you a paradise. You can do anything you want to. You can eat of any tree in the garden, but don't eat of this one tree. And that's what they did. They did the one thing that you ask them not to. You give them everything and you tell them not to. And all it takes is one little temptation and there they go. And then... The world became so corrupt that you had to end it. And so the, you brought the great flood and there was only one family that was even redeemable in all the world. And so Noah and his family were saved. And then the world became so corrupt again that now here you are with your 12 disciples, these guys, and you have put your hope in them? That Look at them. They're all asleep. You have asked them to stay awake and pray with you and they're all asleep. Even your inner circle, Peter, James, and John, look at them, they're right there. And they're sound asleep. And Peter, he's going to deny that he even knows you tonight. And that other one, Judas, as we speak, he is betraying you for some silver coins. These are the people that you have come to sacrifice yourself for? This is, this, is what, this is what you're doing. Don't do it. Give up. Take off. It's dark. And everybody is asleep. And Judas is on his way here now with the temple guards. And he's going to use an act of affection, a kiss, to betray you when he gets here. Hmm. But there was also someone else that was speaking to Jesus. It was the spirit of the living God. 
Some of you probably, and I'm, listen, I'm, I'm one of you, so I, I know how this works. Some of you probably feel as if you are unworthy. You're not worth the skin that you're in. Some of you probably feel that way from time to time. Some of you may feel that way right now. Some of you at home that are listening, you may feel that way right now. I'm not worth saving. Every time, every time God does something for me, I go out and do something stupid. Every time God pulls me back in and he speaks a word to me, I go out and I do something dumb and rebellious and I am not worth a nickel. But Jesus was hearing from the Spirit. The Spirit's willing. He was hearing from the Spirit. And the Spirit was saying to him, Peter might be asleep right now, but he's not going to be asleep long. He is the rock. When, when he gets filled with the Holy Spirit, in 50 days he's going to stand up to these same people that he's cowering to tonight. He will stand up to them and he will tell them who you are and he will tell them what they have done and he will be the rock and you will build your church upon him and the gates of hell will not prevail against this forward moving force of the church. The gates of hell will not prevail against the church. And this guy, John, he knows who you are. And he's going to tell the whole world who you are. He's going to reveal to the world who you are. And the rest of these guys, except for Judas, the one that had to be lost, the rest of these guys, they're going to give their lives for you. They're going to lay their lives down. They're going to be world shakers. They're going to be earth shakers. They're going to shake the foundations of religion and the political systems and everything in the world will be shaken because these 11 guys are called and they have a purpose. And God the Father has a vision for them. And Jesus, the scripture says it was for the joy. Can you imagine having joy in that moment? You know you're about to be tortured. And you have joy. I believe that there were times in that garden between sweat that was as drops of blood and frustration and prayer. I believe there were times of joy and I believe that Jesus actually had a smile on his face at times thinking about his disciples and thinking about us and what that spirit would say to you today is that you have a purpose. God has a plan for you and he has a purpose for you and you are worth everything to him and he wants to make you into the type of person that he is, the kind of person that shakes the surroundings, that shakes the people around you. He wants you to be a life changing force. He wants you to be a world changing force. And if we come together as the body of Christ, as the church, the gates of hell will not prevail against us. That's who we are. So your deeds will complete your faith. What is God calling you to do right now, today? And let's just take some baby steps. It doesn't have to be something where you sell everything you have and go do something. Maybe it's just you need to forgive somebody. Maybe it's just you need, there's somebody in need that you know of and you can go and help them. Maybe, maybe that's it. If you open yourself up to God and you say, Lord, what deeds will complete my faith today? What, how, can I, how can I grow my faith? How can I energize my faith? How can my faith become strong today? What deeds can I do to complete my faith and be the kind of person, at least start today, to be the kind of person that you have called me to be? And he will speak to you. He will let you know. I've done it a thousand times and I know what I'm talking about. He will let you know. The question is, are you going to get up off your seat and do it? My parents are here, so I can't 
I can't say what I had on my mind. No. Are you going to get up and make a move? Are you going to do what God wants you to do? Are you going to let your, your deeds complete your faith? Or are you just going to sit and believe some stuff that you read in the Bible? It takes both, y'all. It takes both. 